Welcome to Creative Con 2021. My name is Neil Maiden. I'm Professor of Digital Creativity here at City University of London, based in the Bayes Business School, and I shall endeavour to be your host this afternoon. We have a, a packed programme to get through, so I'm going to kick off straight away at one o'clock with some basic housekeeping notices for this conference. First of all, please mute yourselves if you're not already muted and turn your cameras off. We've designed the program so that you can drop in and out of sessions uh, of interest. They are themed according to the program, which you can see online. The Zoom link will remain live until 5 p.m. Uh, UK time. And of course, you can come in and out at any point as managed by our conference elves. Please post any questions or comments in the Zoom chat room. Um, you will note as time goes by that the chat room is being moderated and we will collect questions to be asked during the panel sessions at the end of each hour. So we won't be taking questions after each talk. They will be collected up um, after each 45 minutes and uh, the session chairs will be asking those questions on your behalf. If you are using social media, tag us uh, in at Seabay Centre on Twitter and Creativity Enabled by AI on LinkedIn or just hashtag CreativeCom21. You can find all of these links also in the CreativeCom link. Sorry, start again. CreativeCom.live website. Um, the agenda this afternoon has been curated very carefully to reflect our centre's knowledge exchange remit on behalf of Research England, our Centre for Creativity Enabled by AI, which will I'll give a brief introduction of in just a minute. Each hour of this uh, conference explores different ideas on the subjects of collaboration, creativity, commercialization, ethics, and future thinking, all through the lens of different digital technologies. And again, the full agenda is available on our website, creativecom.live. Just a little bit about uh, our centre. Um, the Centre for Creativity Enabled by AI, which we call CBAE for short, uh, was launched last October with funding from Research England. And it's intended to be a national centre to encourage national and international levels of activity, primarily to bring creative thinking to businesses through new kinds of technologies and particular AI technologies. We're reaching beyond the traditional remit of machine learning and uh, big data to encompass technologies such as computational creativity. And at the moment, we're developing a suite of products that have been tailored to support creative thinking, uh, for example, about business models for SMEs, for consulting businesses to solve problems on behalf of their clients, elite sports coaching, which you'll hear about a little bit in the first hour, service product design and health and safety. These are just some of the sample products that we're working to develop with partners. And at the same time, we're also developing new models of knowledge exchange, which are partner led. We're exploring new kinds of collaboration between uh, practitioners, businesses, consultancies, and our own center, so as to maximize the knowledge exchange capability based on the technologies that we're developing. Just to give you a flavor of what these tools look like, they are largely interactive. They're often called um, co-creative AI tools. And the main focus is not on automation per se, but augmentation of professional workers' capabilities. So that's just a little bit of the uh, scene setting for our conference. It's now my delight to introduce the conference's keynote speaker, Professor Anthony Finkelstein, who is the new president of our university, City University of London, and formerly chief scientific advisor for national security to Her Majesty's government until earlier this year. I just want to say also that Anthony has been a colleague of mine throughout much of my academic career and someone that I've learned a lot from, and I'm hoping he's going to continue that trend in the next 10 minutes. So I shall stop sharing and Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Neil. It's great to be here and um, uh, to be working with you again after um, a short intermission. Um, what I'm going to do is this: uh, um, um, I've got a keynote speak, uh, a talking slot, um, but it's um, an accelerated one. Um, 
So I'm going to have to condense a lot of what I wanted to say into um, a, a, small sp a small space. What I'm going to do is I'm going to basically run through what I've learned uh, about university industry collaborations from doing an awful lot of them. And then I'm going to say a little bit about what I've learned um, uh, from doing um, uh, university startups. Um, and um, uh, I hope that some of this will resonate with people on the, um, on the call. So what have I learned about successful university industry collaboration? The first is the best collaborations start from problems. Um, when you start with a practical problem, it doesn't necessarily imply a purely instrumental or short-term approach, but actually helps to shape um, the way you get academic engagement. So challenge-based um, works best for collaborative projects. Frankness and sharing of strategy and timelines. It may seem bizarre, but many collaborations are attempted without people feeling the need to share, or worse, actually withholding their strategy and their timelines. Industry partners don't share their commercial strategy for competitive reasons, and universities don't share their translational strategy um, uh, um, because they don't have one, and they don't share their research strategy for fear it's at odds with what they've um, um, uh, with the goals of the collaboration and this bakes in risk there's no secrets there's no point in engaging in collaborative research if you're unwilling to share potentially commercially sensitive data you can't expect industrially relevant research to proceed in the absence of frontline date, uh, uh, data so before you kick off you need to make quite sure that, that you can get it. On the whole, so this is uh, uh, something I call reject the project. So, and I realize I'm a bit of a pub bore on this subject. Um, the project has become a bit of a fixed notion in research, a scoped and delimited research question worked on over a fixed period against a predetermined work plan. Um, and basically, um, uh, this is actually an ill-suited model for university industry collaborative research. Um, shortening the timeline doesn't help. There are many other models available, um, and we need to think more openly here. Research is a relationship business, and relationships take time and patience. Uh, the university needs to devote resources to manage the relationship. The industry partner needs to assign the right person. And that means somebody from the sharp end of, the, of their activity, somebody with contacts and currency. Both need to avoid churning people at the university industry interface. Personal chemistry really matters in this regard. Teaching each other. Both parties come to a research collaboration with a good deal of background, prior research and experience. This needs to be shared. And the best way is to devote the time um, uh, to teach each other. This process of establishing a common platform of concepts and techniques and shared language can be incredibly productive and shouldn't be skimped on. Exploit existing work, don't start from scratch. If either party's already made progress, exploit it. There's a bizarre version of not invented here that often tempts collaborators to start from a blank sheet of paper. And that isn't the way to make the partnership sing. Um, in every science area of science and engineering, there are big name individuals and institutions. They have reputation and track record. They're the brand, the successful collaborator. They are also busy and overcommitted. Um, uh, they'll undoubtedly be pleased to work with you, but buying their full attention is going to be um, expensive. Your money will buy a lot more commitment from an early career academic 
than it will from a big name. Um, so use the big name to talent spot, um, uh, but um, uh, buy wisely. Students are a valuable resource, but let's be frank, sometimes you get the A student and sometimes you get the F student. Um, uh, you need to remember that a student is learning and will take time to get up to speed and they've got their own goals, perhaps to get a doctorate, um, uh, that are ultimately going to take priority and may not be wholly compatible with the aims of the collaboration. Um, industry need to be aware of it, universities need to educate according, accordingly. Use smart money. Universities are complex organizations and they have a wide range of ways of funding things. The same amount of money delivered in different ways can have very different effects. Stop quibbling. I've seen many collaborations, far too many, founder over arguments relating to IP that neither party are in a position or are actually intending to exploit. Um, uh, uh, actually, um, these arguments often relate to IP that is realistically unlikely to arise from the collaboration or where the route to exploitation isn't available. Um, uh, often, the tech transfer office is blamed um, uh, for that, but the building blocks of partnership and risk sharing are the responsibility of the academics. Revealing win conditions is also really important. What constitutes success in a collaboration is not always clear. Perhaps presentations to senior management are more important than scientific paper. Perhaps patents are value, perhaps keynotes at industry conferences, um, perhaps prototypes. You just need to um, uh, um, my experience suggests that often people may pay lip service to scientific papers, but actually other things buy credibility. My last point, external funding isn't free cash. It's very tempting to leverage a collaboration using funding from government research, and it may or may not be the right um, uh, thing to do. But funders have their own goals and expectations that may not necessarily align with either the university or, the, what, or what industry wants to achieve. They have frameworks that significantly restrict the way that work is conducted. Understanding the implications of a decision to look for external funding um, is really important. More of the wrong sort of money may mean less of the right sort of uh, research. So I'll stop there because I was only given a, a few minutes and hand back to Neil. Thank you, Anthony. That was perfect timing. I have a new app of acting as a timer and I apologize for the beeping. It's like an alarm clock in the morning. Um, fantastic insights there and a really dynamic and focused start to the conference. So we're now going to move on with the first of three presentations. Um, the first one is going to be given by Dr. Dia Albacour, who is Principal Data Scientist at Signal AI, a company that has grown in a few short years from an East End garage to a multinational media company. And that growth was fueled by the Knowledge Transfer Partnership of Innovate UK, which placed data science academics at the heart of business to drive innovation. So, uh, Dia, your, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks for the intro and for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, a quick intro uh, about myself, uh, Principal Data Science and Signal. Uh, prior to Signal, I was in academia, uh, did a PhD, uh, then a postdoc and the lecturer position, then decided to move to the industry, and it's been uh, six years now, and I've enjoyed it a lot. Um, what I did, though, is that I kept the link to academia through collaboration and knowledge exchange. Um, and this is what I thought would be a good topic to talk about for this conference. Um, and I hope you would find my thoughts um, that I will share today interesting and useful. Uh, so first, let me introduce um, Signal AI and the context we uh, work in. Um, and then I will tell you about why and how we collaborate with academia. Um, Signal AI is a rapidly 
uh, growing research-led scale-up. Uh, we're based in London, but also we have offices in uh, New York and Hong Kong. And what we do is we have a decision augmentation platform, um, helping 600 organizations across the globe, um, including 40% of the Fortune 500 companies, to primarily monitor their reputation and, and uh, more interesting to do things like understanding risks and opportunities around investment, uh, ESG and supply chain. And you can see some of the clients uh, we work here, uh, we work with in, in this slide. And to help you understand a bit more what I mean by a decision augmentation platform, uh, I'm giving here in this slide more details. Uh, so we ingest millions of documents every day, representing news, blogs, transcription of broadcasts, and so on, from various sources globally. And then we apply natural language processing, machine learning, and AI techniques to make sense of this unstructured content uh, by recognizing the entities mentioned, uh, so the organizations, the people, the products, etc., the topics discussed, uh, and the sentiment around the entities in these documents. Also spotting any trending anomalies um, uh, from this content, such that we can draw insights and help users find relevant information. For example, allowing PR and comp professionals finding negative mentions that affect their brand reputation, or allowing investors to identify risks for their portfolio companies. And as you can see, there are plenty of challenges in building AI and machine learning components for this platform. And indeed, research has always been at the core of the company. Uh, with an experienced team uh, who are active in multiple academic and practitioner communities like information retrieval, natural language processing, and machine learning. And I actually happened to have met the co-founder um, while we were both doing our uh, PhD back in the days before uh, he, he founded the company, and I joined Signal because of this uh, connection. So why we collaborate with Academia at Signal AI? So the first reason is, is access to specialized knowledge. So as you saw earlier, we had plenty of challenges in NLP, natural language processing, and it's impossible to keep up-to-date knowledge for all the tasks. Um, collaboration with universities can play an important role by allowing exploratory research on the most cutting edge alternatives on how to solve certain problems. Also another aspect is talent acquisition and retention. Um, many of our data scientists who work at Signal come from academia, and one of their drivers is giving back to the community. And staying in academia for those over time is something critical in order to stay up to date um, with development in certain fields or contribute to these fields. So it helps keeping them happy uh, in, in a very competitive uh, market, actually, to hire and retain data scientists these days. And finally, it's also about brand reputation. So for us at Signal, our main differentiation and defensibility is that we apply AI to solve the challenges faced up by our clients. And being part of the relevant academic and practitioner community actually strengthens strengthen our differentiation and backs it up. Of course, it's easier said than done. Um, and, uh, you know, there are many challenges in, in doing these collaborations. And I would like to give a flavor of the challenges we face in doing applied research in general at Signal. Uh, and in, in collaborating with, with academics and young academics uh, in particular. So uh, the first thing I would like you to, to spend 20 seconds um, uh, to look at this image, uh, and hopefully you will get uh, a hint of what I'm trying to explain here uh, on planning and iteration. Uh, and hopefully you're not doing that uh, at the moment and you're not falling into this. So obviously, uh, in uh, Signal AI, uh, we build products. And there are a few things that relate to doing research uh, within this context. So in academia, to study a problem, uh, we formulate research questions, but you usually have the freedom to go deep. Um, in a product development context like ours, we should always think about the business value. Um, and we should be pragmatic and not carry out research because it's interesting. We should not say, let's do deep learning because it's cool, everybody is doing it. That doesn't mean we should just hack things. Research should always bring value and competitive advantage, but we should understand the value very well before taking risks. And to do so, we have to evolve our understanding by starting with simple baselines and then evolving uh, that uh, through user feedback and metrics, uh, because that can feed into our learning and perhaps can guide us to whether or not we should do more sophisticated things. We can then repeat this cycle of building, measuring, and learning uh, iteratively. Second stop um, 
again, I would like to spend some time looking at this uh, and hopefully um, you would know what I would be talking about. So one of the, the main differences I faced when moving to industry is the diversity of skill set uh, around me. So working with engineers, UX designers, salespeople, marketing, etc. What I learned is it's crucial for my success to collaborate and communicate effectively in this environment. And crucial to that is the ability to explain complex concepts to different audiences. In academia, researchers are detail-oriented and we may struggle in explaining complex concepts. It's hard sometimes to identify the right level of detail suitable for certain audience and jumping between these levels an important skill that researchers should develop in this environment. Um, and I will give a practical example um, uh, here. So what we often see that researchers or academics are comfortable in communicating to fellow researchers. So the first row uh, in this slide. So at the low level, they can give details about their work um, and that's what they typically do. They write papers and go to academic conferences. However, in our environment, um, they need to talk to different audiences all the time and adapt their language and term terminology accordingly. So, for example, if we want to explain the first row to a different audience, say engineers, uh, because we want to put a, a model in production, we should simplify the terminology and share the details that matters to them. Uh, so things like computation and, and, and memory become relevant. Also, when we go to a less technical audience, like customer support in this case, it becomes even more difficult and we want to simplify the language further. Um, for example, uh, it's enough to say that we are using AI and clearly state the, using, the business value for them and what matters to them. And the uh, last step is around evaluation. And um, here, um, it's key to be able to tie any evaluation metric to business or user value. A simple example, is if you're developing a binary classifier to solve a problem, so machine, the machine learning researcher tend to use classification accuracy as the metric to assess the quality of the classifier. Uh, but we need to think about the user value before deciding on that in an applied context. What I mean is that higher accuracy may not add value to the user. Um, but in some cases, the, the, it's vital for the user not to miss any positive things while tolerating some noise. And in this case, we may need a different metric. And uh, finally, I would like to uh, leave you with a few examples of collaboration we've done at Signal. Uh, so as Neil mentioned, we, we were founded based on a, a UK innovative knowledge transfer partnership program, um, where 60% of, 66 of the funding comes from Innovate UK and 33% comes from the company. The company uh, was founded on a KTP project and we actually had another one uh, recently to develop further capabilities. And another important form of collaboration is our visiting research program where we host a PhD student for a period of three to six months, uh, or we get a master student to work with us on their final year project. And we've been doing this since 2015. We had students from UK and European universities like UCL, Essex, Glasgow, and Amsterdam to name few. And for us, they help us either improving an existing component or reduce uncertainty. For them, they get exposure on what it's like to work in industry. And it's been a win-win situation. And in fact, many of these have resulted in features eventually made it uh, to our products. Also impossible, we encourage the visiting researchers to publish the results of their work uh, in conferences um, and, and workshops. And finally, uh, there are other forms of indirect collaborations uh, like sponsoring conferences, um, essentially to create brand awareness uh, and visibility. Uh, introducing a new award in a conference to encourage researchers to think about business value uh, and organizing meetups and workshops. And I will stop here. Thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to your thoughts and questions during the panel. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Um, fascinating and much that I recognize and support in what you said. Uh, I'm now delighted to introduce uh, someone else that I've worked with in the past, Jenny Shorley who is Head of Engaged Scholarship at Manchester Metropolitan University and a non-executive director of Praxis Oriel, the UK's, um, screen disappeared, the UK's leading body for knowledge exchange professionals. Um, Jenny, the floor is yours. 
Hi there, good afternoon. Sorry about that, Neil. I think that was me being too previous with getting my presentation up. I'm very impressed with the timekeeping so far. I will I will attempt um, to, to, to carry on with that uh, new tradition. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for having me today. I'm, I'm delighted to be here at the inaugural conference uh, for CBay. Um, and as Neil said, I'm, I'm kind of here with two hats on, really. One is my, my day job, which is my role at Manchester Met University. And my second one um, is uh, as a board member and, and a course director here at Praxis Oral. I've been, I, I kind of thought long and hard about um, what it might be useful to talk about today. I'm, I'm really fascinated by all the different case studies that we have coming up and, and particularly the Dyer's work, um, which was great. I think you, you packed in a, a lot there and particularly some of, some of the case studies at the end. I, I thought for me, um, what might be a useful thing to discuss um, might be some work at Praxis Oral around the national picture around what knowledge exchange is, the concept of knowledge exchange, and a few kind of local experiences from, from me within a business school. So obviously that, that may be slightly unusual for some of our colleagues here today. Although I do think we're, we're, we're pretty interdisciplinary. Um, but I just wanted to bring a couple of learnings from that, particularly around a concept of engaged scholarship and also around interdisciplinarity, which of course this, this programme is very much built on um, here at CBay. So um, as Neil said, Practice Oral is the UK's professional association for knowledge exchange practitioners. Um, we have 182 members, um, which span mostly the university sector, but we absolutely have solid representation in both industry bodies and also businesses themselves. And our mission um, is, is based around these three points. So develop, we, we run a lot of training courses, which I'll come on to in a second. They go from very general stuff around foundations of knowledge exchange to more specific areas around tech transfer, contracting, etc. The promoting part of our mission is about representing our members and kind of pushing forward the ecosystem of KE within the UK um, to, to be world leading and connecting is very much a part of that as well as, as we bring people together through conferences, training courses, etc. So that's the, that's the small plug for praxis. Um, but I wanted to mention a couple of things. As part of my role there, I, I'm a course director of something called the Foundations of Knowledge Exchange, along with some colleagues from Imperial and, and Oxford, so very different types of universities to mine. Um, and that programme aims to equip people who may be new in the area of knowledge exchange to, to be able to undertake their role um, and kind of know much more about both the sector and what knowledge exchange actually is. And as part of that, there's a couple of things I kind of wanted to mention. And it was interesting listening to Professor Finkelstein's um, presentation there, talking about the, the, the different types of KE. This, and I must apologize for the, for the age of the table, but unfortunately, HEBC don't, don't do these tables up to date, but it, it bears out. Um, it's the breadth of KE activity that, that there really is. And often we can really focus on IP um, being the kind of be all and end all of KE activity, but actually what, what brings in income, um, that the majority of income is both collaborative and contract research with those other areas there as well. And IP of course is hugely important, but I think sometimes we, we can um, think that that is the only thing um, that, that, that KE is all about effectively. And those collaborative and contract research relationships are about exactly that relationships, which again, I'll kind of come on to. And the second thing I wanted to mention about, about practice was about the skills necessary to undertake knowledge exchange. So we have developed and are about to kind of refresh um, a skills and capabilities framework uh, for people who undertake knowledge exchange. And again, I thought it'd be useful against the backdrop of these amazing case studies that I know that we'll be hearing today to kind of think about all the different capabilities that go into them. So through a process of research um, and discussion over kind of several years and refreshing up to now, the, these are the kind of 16 capabilities, of course not exhaustive. Um, and we have some very standard stuff in there that you would expect. So generating and managing funds, opportunity identification. But just wanted to draw attention to a couple of areas um, that we may not necessarily consider to be part of knowledge exchange. So student employability, for example, Dial was just talking about KTP projects. I mean, it's a, that's a huge and, and massively important route to student employability, to student ambition, um, which is an absolutely a part of, of a successful KE programme. Um, as well as strategy formation, I think a couple of the key skills that have come out from people who do knowledge exchange is very much entrepreneurship and leadership, 
I think by its nature, knowledge exchange is new, it's different, and it's sometimes uncomfortable for people to take part in. It's about having ideas and really persuading people around to, to, to using those ideas. And I think CBA is very much an example of that, really. It's about doing something wholly innovative and interdisciplinary, so bringing people together who won't usually work together, um, which again, we'll kind of come back to. So just wanted to mention those as a bit of a kind of background, really. And in terms of a local view, as I say, this is very much from social science, this is from a business school, but hopefully it might, it might be interesting to consider. So engaged scholarship is a, is a concept um, that was first drawn up by Andrew van der Ven in 2007. Um, and it's basically a way of looking at participative research. So bringing in those who are not in academia into the research process and seeing what comes out of it. So this is his diamond model, his kind of famous diamond model. Um, Key thing is formulating a problem. Statistics are numbing um, and you need to talk to people. So while statistics are hugely important, as are the numbers in developing these things, talking to people about the problem. And again, going back to, to Professor Finkelstein's um, presentation around the problem being the thing that, that drives knowledge exchange. And then from formulating that problem, we start building a theory from the ground up using those perspectives of practitioners of those in industry and policy as well. And in terms of research design, again, it's all about discussing with people, looking at the human face of data, which again, I think is probably very relevant to this project and, and, and the aim of what it is that we're trying to do, looking at how you can be creative with something that's often seen as wholly technical. And then eventually the problem solving part of it, once you've developed all these, and that communication, once again, is central, as is impact too, which I think is hugely important. I just wanted to mention that Engaged Scholarship is part of a UKRI project that I'm a co on called the Good Employment Learning Lab. So just to show that it does bear out in reality. Um, and we are obviously based in Manchester and we're looking at the challenges of management in Manchester, working with a huge range of partners and building those theories, building those problems and those questions up together. Um, I just wanted to mention that is something that we're working on. And as part of that is an adult social care learning lab, particularly pertinent with the relevant policy discussions that are happening at the moment. So I wondered if engaged scholarship was a useful way of describing knowledge exchange in that knowledge exchange is often generative. So we don't start from a, a particular perceived theory. Researchers have to start from that problem. But it's also evaluative. Has it, has it worked? Has it brought in the income or whatever aim it is that we're looking to do? It's hugely collaborative. I think that's, that's massively important. And it has a dual purpose, both academic and often um, impact driven, be that financial or otherwise. And then I just wanted to mention it's interdisciplinarity and the importance of that. So here are a couple of examples of, of work that, that we have done with our science and engineering and arts colleagues as well. So the Manchester Fuel Cell Innovation Centre would not have been funded had business school and social science not been part of this. But it's it's European Regional Development Fund funding. It's four million pounds. Um, and we created this idea of driving forward this very nascent industry in terms of hydrogen fuel cells by combining it with SME support. So we are looking at both ends of the spectrum and that's something that's really borne out. And now we're doing knowledge exchange with much larger companies, policy makers, international partners. Life 4.0, it is a, it's kind of sprung from this ethos of working together. So that was sprung from some sandpits that we held with researchers around Industry 4.0. And the concept is that we're now taking forward that actually it's not just uh, about those technical problems that we may have um, within AI or considering Industry 4.0, but looking at other aspects as well. So for example, we're looking at the predictors of a disease at the moment, um, and we're taking the standard medical factors, but also looking at environmental factors, social factors, etc. So the interdisciplinarity is key. We're also a regional partner for the National Centre for Academic and Cultural Exchange. So this is very much around arts um, and cultural sector and the notoriously kind of challenging KE landscape around there. And that's enabled us to bring together, it's, it's led by the Culture Capital Exchange based in London, who I know have got significant um, links um, with the City University. Um, but that's really allowed us to bring together across 
um, the university architecture, academic science, academics, arts, academics. And it, it's just been a way of, of bringing those skills together with industry. And the last thing I wanted to mention is the view from the outside, which is kind of bolstering that really. So as one of my other roles is looking after accreditations um, and we had the business school impact system at Kunsu Accreditors a couple of years ago. And as part of this, we interviewed stakeholders and they requested that the university change completely and create a faculty of business and technology because that is what they're interested in. They're not bothered about our faculty, our faculty rules, our, our silos. And I know that we're aware that we all work in silos, but it was really interesting. And that's obviously not something that we're going to do, but that's actually what industry wants. They're not interested in our disciplines. They're interested in getting a problem solved. So I hope that that has uh, remained on time. Um, my apologies for the whistle stop tour, but thank you very much. I look forward to discussing later. Thanks, Dick Jenny. A lovely point to end on there. I can imagine some of my academic colleagues, their toes curling at the thought that it's um, definitely an important topic to discuss. So if you have any questions or comments on what Jenny has said, uh, please again put it in the chat and we'll collect these up at the, uh, the end of the next talk, which is from sports performance, performance consultant Alex Wolf. Alex has been working with our CBA team to develop a new digital tool, which we call SportsBarks, which is a collaboration between a Premier League football team and our Centre for Creativity enabled by AI. And we thought you might be interested to hear how this collaboration came about and a little bit more about the tool. So Alex, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Thanks Neil, for, for that. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as, as Neil said, I'm going to talk about Sports Spark, but kind of frame it around what this first session is around collaboration. Use, use the the Sports Spark tool as as the case study for uh, effective collaboration. But before I kind of get into the tool, it's probably worth going back a little bit um, and giving a bit of context to me and what what I've what I have done and, and still doing to to a certain degree. So I've spent um, 16, 17 years working with Team GB. Uh, looking after the the coaches which provide the the support to the athletes that go on and compete for uh, Great Britain and I wanted to show you this this uh, graph which is just the number of medals that the British team have won since since Atlanta and you can see roughly around Sydney there's been a big leap up in in, in medals which has coincided with a large amount of investment and that investment has been around the, the people that work with these with these athletes so we we clearly are are moving in the right direction as a as a nation and um we are probably punching well above our weight when you compare to some of the other nations like the us and china uh the um the, the russians as well in terms of what we're able to to do on the, on the world stage however when we when we start looking at the experience of our coaches working with those with those athletes one of the things we notice and particularly around this this is framing around it in the 2016 olympic games a number of our coaches um have very little experience well, about 65 percent have never um, been involved in preparing athletes for an olympic games 80 percent of them had never been involved in preparing athletes for an away games which meant they only had supported athletes at a at the london games which is a, a very different environment to an, to an away games and um, space and that that's what the a critical point for us to to start with because this is kind of the, the evolution and the start of why we um we started trying to move uh, towards something which eventually became sports parts the second point which is worth noting as we became more successful we moved away from this very um small support team around individuals we have the athlete in the center have seven or eight people who are very closely linked to that individual and we're able to work very effectively and collaborate effectively to support that 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 athlete or group of athletes However, as we moved towards 2016 and beyond, what we found we had a much more contingent workforce. So we had larger numbers of people working with individuals, much smaller, much smaller opportunities to collaborate because we were so disparate around where, where we were. So it became much more challenging. So paired with a, a young, young and inexperienced workforce and a much more contingent workforce, we needed to kind of work out a way of trying to, trying to improve the, uh, the, the support we provide the athletes. And this, this brings us to kind of the, the first point of where sports box really, really originated. And it started with our kind of real clarity, what we were trying to achieve. And the first bit was we needed to really increase the quality and quantity of our inexperienced coaching team around their reflective practice and problem solving. So they could 
um, establish greater clarity on what they're really trying to what problems they're really trying to solve and have, make much more informed decisions with the ethics they, they work with. And that was our, our starting point of where where sports sparks really really originated. And I just want to give you, a, while this is not a huge, a, this isn't really about sports spark in, in its entirety, just give you a quick overview of what the original sports spark tool looks like. And primarily as, as it is around reflect, reflection and problem solving, what we're trying to do here is give the individual coach an, an opportunity to really understand their problem space and where they are, um, where, this, where their biases are and where they might need to think about the, the challenge slightly differently. So this is the first screen that would enter. They would enter their, their performance problem. They would tag it based upon the type of um, area it might be. In this case, it's mental well-being and, and home environment. And then they can start to explore ideas in terms of what the tool comes back. It gives you a, a load of sparks, spark ideas and just challenging the way in which you view the problem or, the, or, or give you a slightly different way to get, gain clarity on, on that, that problem. As we move to where we are now working with a premiership football team, this is what the, the tool is now. So fundamentally, it's still the same, same idea. It, it allows you to describe the problem space, tag it based upon the, the individual or the groups of players that you're working with, what, where the, that might be. And then you can, again, challenge the problem, the constraints and the solutions. And it also points towards Google Scholar and gives you a load of resources which are linked to the, the way in which you've described it. So the whole idea is to perturbate your, your way of thinking um, and to view it out of, out of the normal biases that we may, we may view it. And then you, you come out with all of these idea descriptions. And as we evolve this tool, it's moving into, into a space where it's not just about generating idea, ideas to look at the problem differently or to gain greater clarity, but also help, help people to really problem solve and move it from much more of a heuristic based thinking to a more critical thinking based tool to allow them to formulate a plan of attack to, to, to resolve the problem space. And to give you a bit of good context, um, the top, the picture at the top left is Jamie Cheeseman. He's the head of um, uh, the academy physical preparation team. Um, he he he's described it as giving him much more clarity on the problem spaces that he's working on, and giving him much larger options to consider what, while he's working with the athletes and the 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 individuals he he spends time with. And then on the bottom right, we've got Tom Rusker, who is a uh, strength condition technical lead at the English Institute of Sport, which provides the services to the Olympic and Paralympic sports. And the, the big thing that he keeps coming away, he keeps referring back to is this new way of thinking and changing the way in which he, he thinks. And he was very clear about the idea that it, it, um, it moves you away from your biases and it gives you a way of thinking about things which either weren't available to you at the time or you hadn't, hadn't considered. It's worth noting that I, I no longer work the, for the women, women Olympic sport and I now work as, as a freelance consulting on a number of different spaces and one of those is, is with, with CBay. And while the, the English Institute of Sport invested in this sports box originally and it was a small small budget, a bit more of a proof of concept, it's kind of evolved into something slightly different. So the question I'm kind of left with around this is how a sports spark evolved from a proof of concept within a small organization and tiny budget to a project which is much better invested and supported to develop and de deploy much more widely than a single, single organization. And this is where I think some of the key key attributes, particularly that Professor Anthony Finkelstein spoke about at the beginning, I think there's a large amount of crossover from um, from this. And I think the first bit is around around clarity. So if we're if we're looking at what we were trying to achieve, we were really clear on the on the intention around increasing the quality and quantity of reflective practice and problem solving to help help those coaches have better decision making and um, and reflect, reflection so they can support the athletes more effectively so we were really clear what that what that is and i don't think that's changed from from when, when it's first inception to, to where it is right now and then again i've named it as character there is for, for people to want to work together there needs to be good people and there needs to be a shared alignment and agreement around the, the, the vision of where this tool might go um, and we obviously can see professor neil maiden here um, and lead, leading the the, the conference today but it was with Neil which I stayed in contact with from from day one when I was working in in the uh, in the organization and continue to work with uh, alongside the last three or four years now in, in some some capacity and only only more recently as, as a consulting bit the the reason I bring that up is if you don't have good people you're not likely to want to work with each other and I think you know, people don't do business with businesses they do business with people and I think that's a really important concept for for us if, if we want to collaborate effectively we need to find the, the right people to work with 
The next bit is around a named it chance. And the reason I say chance, there's no there's no way I would have met Neil originally if it wasn't for one of my colleagues, Chris, that had been doing the the uh, masters in innovation, creativity, and leadership at uh, Bayes Business School. And it was at that point where Chris had was was being taught by Neil and was and was talking around digital creativity. And this is where the kind of digital creativity tool was first kind of introduced to us. And we knew we needed to go down the dig digital pathway. And it just so happened at that time that Neil was the right person to talk to, and which is why we've kind of continued to work in that space with him. And then the idea of investment, and it's not just about from a financial investment, but investment in, in expertise as well. And I think we've very clear what, what CBA offers is, is a much, much better wraparound support to this tool than what we, we would have been able to do within, within a small proof of concept or small budget operation within, within the organisation. So I think for me, these four characteristics are, are critical. And if, and if I was to put it into almost a, a collaboration equation, one of the things I would definitely say is that... Um, they're, they're all additive that if you have good clarity so we know what we're trying to change you have good people working within there and i'd put the chance in there as well in that that you have um, the opportunity to exploit those opportunities when they come and multiply that by the, by the investment then the opportunity to collaborate effectively and be successful with that collaboration exponentially in, in increases in, in, in my view um so i'm going to leave it there i know that's a, probably a, a whistle tops stop to all of them and look forward to taking your questions in the uh, in the next bit thank you so thank you alex please remain on camera and can i ask uh, dia and jenny to switch their cameras on as well <laughs> excuse me and unmute yourselves and we've been collecting up some questions if i can just manage my screen effectively here so um a couple of questions in response to to jenny to start with uh, graham dransfield who's business development manager at City, says that I see that regeneration and development is a significant source of K income. What does that mean exactly? Jenny, enlighten us. Hi there, thanks. Um, apologies, I did answer this on the chat. I didn't, uh, didn't, uh, didn't wait for this lot, which I should have done. So um, yes, it mostly refers to European Regional Development Fund funding, um, which is primarily, it has lots of different areas, but, but most of it is driven towards helping SMEs grow and kind of level up the economies in areas of, of, of economic deprivation, etc. Obviously, that's now finished. We no longer have access to that due to Brexit. And the government is, is yet to announce the kind of solid plans for the Shared Prosperity Fund, but we'll follow it. But we are assured that something will follow it. Thank you, Jenny. And the other question uh, after your talk was, uh, you uh, you described knowledge exchange in arts and humanities and arts and culture as notoriously difficult, I'll put that in quote. Why do you think this perception exists? What are the barriers? Does it have to be difficult or are we just making it hard for ourselves, says Rachel Barnwell, who works in the arts and humanities, I should stress. Excellent um, question. And to be honest, if I'd have had more time, I could have done the whole slot on, on, on this kind of issue, really. But I think I don't actually think that it is that difficult when we come down to it. I think the perception of what knowledge exchange is, um, is part of the challenge here. So often it's just seen as income generation. Um, and that is obviously much more challenging within the arts and cultural sector, um, because a lot of the time, and I'm aware very much that I'm broad brushing it here, um, these organisations, individuals are not driven towards profit, particularly it's about a kind of a, a, a driver creativity. Um, so actually measures of what knowledge exchange can achieve and how successful it can be are much more complicated than they may be in a purely financial tri transaction. But I do know that Research England with the knowledge exchange framework are trying to develop that and understand that more to look at the impact um, of knowledge exchange in these areas. So I don't think it's notoriously difficult. I shouldn't have said that specifically. What I kind of meant was the perception of it and kind of measuring it is difficult, but always happy to chat. As I say, I could talk about that for hours, but thanks. And if you have sort of feedback on, on these answers, you can put them back into the chat and through the miracle of technology, they'll come back <laughs> to me. Jenny, since I have your attention, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the others in a second. Someone's asking for clarification about your last point about restructuring academic um, uh, okay. tools. So uh, they just they felt you glossed over that and I can understand <laughs> why. It was, it was purely uh, feedback from some stakeholders that, that we had when we were specifically uh, being measured by um, a European organisation on our impact. And our stakeholders, which were um, alumni that had then gone on to create businesses or been significant um, within industry um, and policymakers, etc., they were just very clear about the fact that they are 
not interested in one specific faculty, one specific department. Um, what they want is a solution to a problem. And often that is very interdisciplinary. And I, sometimes they can feel a little bit frustrated by the, those silos. But actually, it can be a real positive because if we're being driven by those problems, we can open up these relationships within our universities to do something different. Yeah, it at least needs sort of horizontal structures as well as vertical structures that are not secondary to the current ways in Absolutely. which we work. And that's very much what we, we built CBA to do. So um, I'll put that in. Um, for Dia, um, you have a PhD in computer science and have undertaken postdoctoral research on a number of projects. Do you agree with the view that collaborating with industry or spending time in it is damaging to an academic career path and detracts from the attractiveness of such activities? For academics, that was a long question. That's an interesting one. Um, I don't think so. I think uh, I think it, on the contrary, it's actually uh, it will help academics to essentially do things that that matter to to industry and and guide their research. Um, and I think it's it has to be bi-directional, right? So so also we as industry, we we, we need to be talking more to, to academics and, and and create debates on on things um that they're not necessarily aware of. Um so yeah, I, I well the, the short answer is no. And I think there is more to be done in both directions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, there there is there is a space um you know for academics to, to continue working in, in academia whilst also um, being more interactive with, with what's going on in industry. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed when you introduced yourself, you were an academic and now you work in industry. Was there ever a moment where you thought you may be able to do both, part-time academic, part-time industry? Uh, I think I, I only have these thoughts when I think about, you know, uh, the future, like, do I want to go back to, to academia at one point? Um, maybe yes, um, but I haven't, perhaps not now. I, I still want to do more in, in industry. I think there's still more things that I would like to do. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, would be probably one day and I might go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and for Alex, uh, you, you finished your, your talk with this uh, formula, collaboration, if I get this right, equals clarity plus character plus chance, all times investment, if that's correct. Um, is it easy to replicate on a managed basis? Um, that's the first question. Is it, is it as easy as in a formula? I think, I think we've all, um, with all things around collaboration around there, there's degrees of collaboration. And I think when you have each of those different factors contributing at different levels, the degree of the effectiveness of the collaboration will be will be felt very differently. So if you're not very clear on a on the outcome, I think um, you may be solving the wrong problem. Um, I think it's harder again with having good people in place because there's not there's not always good people where you where you're um, needing to needing to collaborate um, and I think my, my experience working more now as a as a freelancer than than within well, actually no, probably equally within within working across 30 or different sports and uh, freelancing that it is incredibly difficult to get anything done when um, the people just do not have a shared and agreed understanding of what they need to achieve and are not necessarily liking to spend time with them so as a, as a, as a formula um, I don't think it's necessary yeah. A, a way of saying this is how you get perfect collaboration, but it's more of a like the effectiveness of your collaboration is dependent on the scale of each of those components. Um, and you might have really good um, people and really good clarity, but if there's no real investment, both from a technical competency and from a financial competency, where well, nothing actually moves and just mm -hmm. it, it just stands still. So how can we how can we make these collaborations more effective? How do we how do we contribute to clarity or character or indeed chance? I mean, that's an interesting question. You went into the the vexed topic of serendipity, which is often discussed alongside creativity. Yeah, the chance one's an interesting one because we've, we've I've spoken a lot about it from a sports performance point of view, and when if those who watch the Olympic and Paralympic Games that what one of the one of the things people don't talk about is the, the chance that when you're looking at people winning by 
proper margins of tens, uh, tens or hundreds of seconds, hundreds of a second, then that's a, ch that's a chance. And actually the, the reality is the field is all pretty equal to each other. So it's a chance whether or not you, you there was a degree of chance of, of winning or not. So I don't know how you can, you can necessarily um, overcome that, but I think the, the bit is about exploiting it when it comes. And which is when you look at my experience working with you and, and um, City University that, that we exploited it as, a, as an organization and I've continued to pester you ever since. Um, the, from, from, from the people point of view, I think there's definitely, we spent a huge amount of time and I'm still spending a huge amount of time investing in, in the people and making sure that they, they, they're very clear on who they are uh, the impact they have on, uh, on the surroundings and those around them and what effective collaboration looks like within that space and actually they're re really really aware of how they add or how they detract from the that collaborative space so I do think there's a really big piece in in and around that um, and then from a from the clarity bit again I think loads of there's loads of people and organizations talking about um, culture and purpose and so on I think they fundamentally need to start with getting real clarity on what 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 has to has to occur, and I think that the 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 biggest thing is if you don't get that bit right, you'll get halfway down a pathway and realise you've gone down the wrong pathway, and you have to almost come back again to work out where where it goes. So we and then if problem solving is two sides of the same coin, one being clarity of outcome, and the second is kind of suppose the the availability and interactions of solutions. Then you can only apply the the solutions until you have real real clarity. So you, you're better off spending more time on the clarity than you are on the, on the solution side. Gotcha. So just coming back to Deer and Jenny, um, Alex is almost waving the magical wand, the need for clarity in different ways. Is there one thing that you could like to change about the way in which academia and, and industry collaborate within the UK? So one thing that would improve things dramatically? I can have a start. I think one of the things Thank that I'd like uh, to see is um, actually the, the, the actual courses that are being taught at universities, they focus on the technical knowledge and technical um, basically concepts and ignore, especially I'm talking about computer science, ignore sometimes the soft skills. Um, so I think mm -hmm. that, 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 that is a change I'd like to see. It's more like focusing on things like communication, Mm -hmm. um, for example, in computer science, doing more pair programming and, and, and group projects, uh, that would be very useful for people, um, to, you know, to, to, to get them ready to, to join industry and collaborate with industry. No, I agree with that one. I think there is an increasing focus of soft skills, certainly on our degrees. Jenny. Um, thanks. I, I just um, very handily like to uh, kind of nick Dyer's point there, really, I think, um, and kind of go back to the interdisciplinarity point, because I, I think that those soft skills are a part of that, part of bringing kind of business savviness, um, business skills, as well as other stuff up to more technical programs and the other way around as well, which is something that we're trying to do through degree apprenticeships, which are designed jointly by business. So I think that's, uh, that's it is absolutely a kind of clear steer from there. I don't think that doing it is particularly easy. I think it is a challenge. We're large, slightly unwieldy institutions and um, with very important specific um, disciplinary roles to play, but I, I, I do very much agree with the soft skills. Like, can I just add something, Neil, as well on that as well? Cool. I think one, one of my, my experience over the last 18 months of putting in a load of tenders for pieces of work is that often the tenders we go for aren't clear what they're looking for. Um, and that's okay, but they're, when, you, when we get to the final process and we get to, the, get, to, get, to the, get to that point, never in the tenders have I found that there's a, a a kind of a problem solving bit at the beginning is all already like it's, it's been described and actually I think if people step back and say this is what we think it is but actually we're not quite sure and actually part of the process of having these these collaborations is for us to be really clear on that before we even get into there it saves an awful lot of time I think when when um when we get into the into those process of where you're starting to collaborate because you think it's one thing and then when we got in there it's a totally different thing and we tended for something totally different so I think there is definitely a, a piece around just accepting that the clarity may not be there and we can work it out as we as, as we um, start these projects. Thank you, Alex. That is going to be the last point on this first hour on how academia and industry collaborate. Um, I want to thank uh, the three of you very, very much, as well as to Anthony Finkelstein for his opening keynote.